There's nothing greater, I think, for a de-stressor is to ride your bike to work or ride your bike home. It's a great way to, to shed some stress. So, not to mention keep you healthier and so on. So, to create an incentive out of that, we created a program to essentially pay you in cafe credits to ride your bike to work and back. And if you did that in a day's time, uh, that was worth uh, a simple meal in the cafe, a bowl of soup and a chunk of bread. Um, so there again, the cafe comes in handy to be able to, to use this as part of the incentive program to get people to ride their bikes to work. So when I first started making stuff, I didn't want to have anything to do with this whole throwaway society. I thought that you know, the responsible use of the kinds of materials and energy that we're going to use to make these things into these working devices and stuff, I thought that we should make the longest use of that as possible. So making a product that had a long life made a lot of sense in terms of an answer to well, if we're going to use energy and with whatever that energy negative stand, negative aspects that energy has in terms of its use or generation or whatever, um, at least we could use it for something that makes reasonably good use out of it. Okay, so where do we start? Ask the question. Why do we make things here or make things ourselves as opposed to outsourcing or contracting out? Uh, there's a couple uh, considerable reasons for doing that. One is um, by making things here, uh, we have total control over the quality of how they're made, total control over the design of how they're made, and the execution of that design, which is probably the more accurate thing. Is that when we design something, we're designing it knowing that we can make that or that we can modify the design so it's uh, more makeable. Uh, this, this is a term called uh, design for manufacturing. That helps us with the cost of the products. Um, the other main reason that we make things here is that we can also control the processes to the point where we do as much environmental environmentally conscious manufacturing as we can. That's having to do with, uh, one, how we set up and run the machines, but two, all of the things that we use in conjunction with manufacturing, the supplies like oil supplies and things like that, cleaning stuff, so on. And then, of course, the recycling of the, of the scrap materials that are generated during the manufacturing process. We think that's really important, um, especially like an example, knowing that the scrap <clears throat> is actually getting recycled. Now, I think, I think the, the average person would be quite surprised if they could actually see the depth, whether it's here or it's a factory in China, the depth of what goes into making something. Now, it's a lot of choices along the way, from tooling to design to manufacturing process or equipment is a huge amount of decisions and every one of those decisions you could either make it without any consciousness towards the environment or with consciousness right we have that opportunity to make all those with right as much as we can um, and perhaps choose different directions than what might just be driven by cost or the almighty profit, right? Um, and I think that, you know, profit for us isn't just in money terms, it's in, you know, success of the product and success in the eyes of the consumer that's bought the product. Wow, am I happy with this? That's profit.
people who really like their products tell their friends, you should have one of these. Oh, you're tired of your headset rattling? I mean, you should buy one of these. There's been a lot of that over the years, which has been really cool. That's a cool thing, you know, since, since we have total control over the design and manufacture of our bearings, that means that we can get in and do bearing component replacement or repairs on the bearings themselves, which makes it just that much easier for us to, to stay with the, you know, reduced carbon footprint. Um, and over the years, I mean, we, it's not like we decided to do this when we released our lifetime warranty. We've been doing this since we've been selling this stuff. Uh, a part comes back in, and in the past, a, uh, a part would come back in with a bearing that didn't feel good or something. We'd take the bearing apart and either do a really good cleaning of it or replace some balls, perhaps whatever it took to get that bearing running again before we'd actually put a brand new one in there. Yeah, it would have been easier for us to just put a new one in, but if these things are still good, why throw them away? You already paid for it once. We already paid for it once, collectively as <laughs> the, the Earth's inhabitants, right? Um, why pay for it again? <laughs> But I think that, that that concept, if you think about consumerism, um, things that are designed to have a particular life that's just at that point that people accept that you can throw it away and replace it, uh, that people are doing that because now I get an opportunity to sell another one. You think about the difference between the 70s and today, through just about everything that you're exposed to nowadays in the Western world, everything's talking about shorter and shorter attention span. And shorter, toward, uh, shorter and shorter attention span is also to do with all those things that you have around you, right? All the things that you purchase, all those hard goods that are around you, right? They, they don't want your attention to be very long on that stuff, so you're more likely to dispose or replace or let fashion take care of it or choose. Oh my God, just needs to look good. That's part of the problem with the, you know, a lot of the offshoring that's been done to a lot of what used to be American-made products. Still looks like that product, but the materials and the workmanship, although they could potentially be just as good, no, that's, that's not the point. The point is to save a lot of money in materials and workmanship, deliver something that looks the same, but since you're probably not going to pay attention to it, if it wears out sooner, all the better. It's too bad. Yeah, you know, I think that uh, along, over the years, there's been a lot of times where people have said, well, gee, what, um, if you make such a good product and it lasts so long, at some point, will it be, I mean, you'll hit saturation, right? Well, why do I need to buy another one of these things? And that was always kind of a fear at first. It's like, wow, when are we going to hit the saturation point? And then we won't have any, we won't have anything to do. 
well, that never seemed to happen. I mean, granted, I'm sure we felt that somewhere, and I'm not necessarily going to complain that we might have some of the effects of saturation to a certain extent, but I think as the cycling world has grown over the years, we've just kind of grown with it. Or awareness for the product. I mean, here we are, one small company servicing the world with high-quality bike parts, right?